I'd like at this time to invite all the children to come up here. Come on, Beth. You're all right. All righty. Can I have Allie and Alex? Come up here. Allie, you stand on my left. Alex, you on my right. Okay. Do you guys know what a covenant is? covenant. A covenant is the agreement. And any time that, um, that God deals with us, he makes us a covenant or a promise. But in, the, uh, in ancient Israel, they used to make covenants with each other. And how they would make a covenant is they'd elect two covenant representatives. Ali, your representative A. Alex, your representative B. And the two tribes, tribe A and tribe B, would come together and they'd shake hands and make an agreement. Shake hands and make an agreement. All right. Now, Allie, let's say that Kendra or McKenna are in your tribe. And let's say that the, um, the agreement of your tribes is, the covenant is, not to shake hands with the pastor. Okay? Good enough? Okay. McKenna. You just broke the covenant. <laughs> but I knew that you would. So now, McKenna is in your tribe, and she broke the covenant. Who gets punished for that? You, the covenant representative. That's right. So in the Old Testament, who did God make a covenant with? Abraham. And so uh, Abraham, of course, the nation of Israel sinned and turned away from God, and they broke their side of it. So God had to come and make a new covenant, a covenant where salvation is possible through faith alone and not through works of the law. But we had to end the old covenant, didn't we? And how do we do that? Both covenant representatives have to die. And I'm not going to kill you because I love you both. <laughs> <clears throat> but that's why Jesus had to die on the cross. And he had to die as human because the covenant was made with human. And it had to be a perfect human, one that upheld the very law he was born under. And he had to be God because God was the covenant was with God. And when he died on the cross, he ended the old. And when he resurrected from the dead, he created the new covenant. So we got an idea of what covenant is? All righty. Do we have someone to watch the kids in the gym today, or is it too cold back there? Now, when they departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Now here's the part where the lectionary wanted to leave out. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. That was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. The voice was heard in Ramah, the weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream in Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child, his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in the city called Nazareth. That was what was spoken by the prophets, might be fulfilled, he shall be called a Nazarene. The Gospel of the Lord. Uh, I was reading a book entitled Heaven is for Real. It's a book that my in-laws give me for Christmas. And it's the story of a little boy who's four years old his dad's a pastor, I believe, in Kansas, uh, a Wesleyan pastor. And um, the little boy gets appendicitis, and they don't recognize it right away, and he's almost dead. And they decide to take him then to a, a, a hospital in a bigger town where they recognize it right away, and they operate. Well, during the operation, apparently the boy goes to heaven because he comes back, and he can reaccount for his dad exactly where his dad was, what he was praying, and where his mom was. Well, Dad, you were in the waiting room praying, and Mom was on the cell phone crying. And he talks about how he saw Jesus, and he saw heaven, and the colors, and he saw the guy's grandfather, and so forth. And, and I don't know 
where I'm standing on this just yet, but I suppose it could happen. But what his dad asked him is, well, what did you do when you were in heaven? He said, I did homework. Well, homework? That's kind of odd. He says, yeah, yeah, Jesus is my teacher and he gave me homework. So today, with the reading of the flight from Egypt, to Egypt and from Egypt, I got not a whole lot but to give you a lesson. So we're going to teach a lesson today and you're going to have homework. The four lessons, this is my four point sermon, going back to the old days. Point one, the four points, four lessons that we can learn from today's gospel reading are, one, God intervenes in situations of human crisis. Although his intervention most times, as we talked about Christmas Eve, is unwanted and unwelcome. The world does not want a savior. They do not want God's law. Because God's law, Romans 3, uh, verses, uh, Romans 3 verses 19 and 20, God's law shows us that we are sinners. So if a savior comes, that must mean that we are a sinner and people don't want to be sinners. They don't want a savior. There's no room for Jesus in the end. There's no room for Jesus in this world. So what does humankind do when the Savior comes into the world? He tries to kill him. And they didn't get him on his birth, but they eventually did. But God intervened. He sent Jesus away because he knew the world would try to kill him. The world doesn't want to have a Savior. How does God intervene today? In those times, he sent most likely Gabriel the archangel to give messages. Well, angel, angelikon in Greek, means messenger. That's all it means. A messenger from the Lord. But today, this is your homework. God doesn't use angels as often. He uses each and every one of you as his angels. You are her mes his messengers. You are his ministers of grace in this world. You are the ones that intervene on behalf of God in human crisis. The second thing we can learn is God protects his great salific rescue mission on earth. God's going to do his mission with or without you, period. It's going to get done. Nothing's going to stop him. Something about being all powerful and something like that. Okay? It's going to happen. God protected the holy family. He protected them from destruction so that his rescue mission on earth would not be interrupted. Well, God protects us, too. I recently read a story of a man who suffered in the hospital 114 days dying of cancer. Well, it doesn't sound like God rescued him or protected him, does it? However, each and every one of those 114 days, the man was joyful, excited, and shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with every single nurse that walked in that door. God didn't save him from death, but God saved him from despair. God protects you from despair. That is the promise made to you, the gospel promise. That is the promise you cling to when you're in despair. Though it may not look like it, though the world may be coming down around me, Jesus Christ is still on the throne and he's still in control. Third lesson, God guides people. It's a lesson in guidance. He's always there guiding. He guided each of you to flee captivity of Egypt and come out south of town here, didn't he? Even though the whole world looked like it was coming to an end. Even though it looked like God was no longer in control. Even though it looked like God had abandoned each and every one of you. One step in faith shows that he was there the whole time guiding you, directing you for his purpose. Again, something about being all-powerful. In the desert that you were led to, you started planting and seeds, nurturing and watering. And look at what sprouted from it. Look around you. The love, the fellowship that you all have for each one another. 